Well, welcome back to New Venture Creation. Uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at Chapter 6, which talks about markets and customers. Which talks about markets and customers. If you think about it, you could have the world's greatest product, best structured business, resources coming out the you know what? But if you don't have any customers, if you haven't penetrated the market, the odds are not very good with regard to you being able to be successful in your business. So let's take a look at Chapter 6. Maybe Chapter 6 can give you some thoughts and clues and find a way to help you with regard to getting customers and penetrating that market. Under Chapter 6, we'll be taking a look at a couple major topics. It looks like I have, let's see, about five or six that, uh, that we're going to get to. The, the sixth one's a little iffy, so we'll see. The, uh, the first major topic that I want to talk about is just an introduction, just an introduction. Uh, and there, there are two points I want to make here. The first point is uh, uh, the definition of what's, what's a market for a product? What's a market for a product? In the textbook, uh, the author has a fairly broad definition here. And it's not a bad definition, but a fairly broad definition. And the, uh, the author defines it as everyone who needs it. We're talking about your product. It is your product. Everyone who needs it is willing and able to pay for it and is reachable by your marketing efforts. Again, it's everyone who needs it, is willing and able to pay for it, and is reachable by your marketing efforts. Not necessarily a bad idea of uh, you know, a way to describe what, uh, what your market is. And the second point that I have for you is uh, an interesting point. It goes back to some of the things we talked about with regard to uh, strategy. Uh, and, it, and it's this. If you take a look at, at all the people who you know need your product, willing to be able to pay for it, reachable, and etc., you know here's your market. Now, now sometimes, now sometimes, uh, you might want to try to go after the whole market, but particularly as a new business, you probably don't want to do that. You might not have the resources to do that, etc. And even if you did, sometimes it's it's more efficient to go after part of the market as opposed to all of the market. So if you, if you decide that that's the case for you, listen, I, I don't want to go to every car purchaser. I just want to go to uh, people who are purchasing cars in the luxury market. So we're just, instead of the whole car market over here, whole car market, uh, you know, being here, we just want a smaller portion of it. We want to go to the luxury market. Maybe there's some reasons for that. Maybe there's more money in it, maybe less competition, whatever it might be. Um, but we've decided that we don't want to go for the whole market. We want to go for a portion of the market. There's a buzzword for going after a portion of the market. You're going after a market segment. A market segment. There's the buzzword for you, market segment. And if you decide to do that, if you decide to go after a segment as opposed to the whole thing, going for that portion, that market segment, you're following a strategy that's known as a segmentation strategy. A segmentation. I'm not going to be everything to all people. I'm just going to go after that portion of the market, that segment of the market that makes sense for me, that, that really fits my company. Now, when you do this, when you go after a segment and you follow a segmentation strategy, this is related to, it's actually kind of a sub-strategy of a strategy we talked about uh, before, and that's the differentiation strategy. Again, differentiation strategy, you're going to differentiate yourself from somebody else. You're going to have something unique or whatever. Well, if you think about it, if you come out with something that's unique, the odds are not the whole market's not necessarily going to be thrilled with you. Only the portion of the market that likes your uniqueness. So oftentimes you'll find that if you follow a differentiation strategy, as a sub-strategy, you're also following a segmentation strategy. So the two are somewhat related. Oftentimes you'll see them together. Well, that finishes up the first topic, the introduction. Let's go to the second talk, tar topic. And that is, uh, you know, who should you be targeting? Who's in your target market? In your textbook, your author has a couple of uh, points to make, a couple of suggestions. And the first, he tells you, here's your goal. He says, he has a goal, and it's kind of interesting. He says, you want to create what he calls, here's a buzz phrase for you, a customer avatar. A customer avatar. You, you, you know what an avatar is. You might have even watched the, uh, the cartoons on it, etc. A movie, I think, came out on it, etc. A customer avatar. Basically, you're going to create, you know, your vision of what your customers look like and are, and etc. And this this a avatar uh, is going to be you know, a persona representing your perfect customer. 
Now, you know you got a million different types of customers, etc. But who's your perfect customer? I mean, if you really had your choice, who would be your perfect customer? Who do you think is going to buy most of this, etc., be more willing to buy and pay, etc., for it? So your customer avatar is going to be a persona representing your perfect customer. Now, it's also, if you think about it, this, this persona, this avatar, it's basically a, a template of who your customer is, who you want to target for, who you want to go after. And if you have this, this avatar, if you have this, this template, it's going to help you in a couple of different ways. One way it's going to help you to determine where to look. If you know what you're looking for, I'm looking for this avatar, I'm looking for this customer, this template or whatever, that might help you to look for it. For example, if I'm going rabbit hunting, I, you know, probably uh, you're not going to be finding me out in the middle of the desert or out in the glaciers or something like that. Probably going to find me in the, in the, in the woodlands someplace uh, to go after rabbits. So one of the things that helps you is it helps you with regard to where to look for your avatar, where to look for your customer. And another thing that your avatar helps you with, helps you to figure out what to say to them what to say to your perfect customer, to your targeted uh, group, again, to your template, your avatar. You know who is, you're going after. Now it helps you to figure out what to say to them. Also, with regard to the goal, one last point that the author makes with regard to goal is your author suggests, and I think with, with a great deal of reason uh, and wisdom, you want to spend your time and your money, you want to spend your resources, trying to reach this this avatar, your, your preferred customer, your target market. You don't want to try to reach everybody. Try to reach everybody when, uh, you know, here's here's the whole market, etc. And, uh, you know, what you're trying to do is, I, I just want to go after this group. Why, why would you spend all your money going after, after the whole group? So one of the things that your author says is, look, spend your money, spend your time, spend your resources reaching your avatar. Don't spend them going after the whole market. It's a waste of time, waste of resources, waste of money, etc. that you have. Not a bad idea. Still under this concept of, you know, who should you be targeting, who, who's in your target market. He had the second major point, the first one was a goal, the second major point that he has here is he has some questions that you should ask as, you, as you're trying to figure out some things about this avatar and what to do with the avatar, this template. You probably want to ask yourself, who has the problem that my product solves? Who has the problem that my product solves? And keep in mind, your author says it's really important, I think your author is right, that you want to come up with a solution to somebody's problem, a solution to the problems of your customer. Don't just come up with a solution and search your customers. Have an idea of what your customer's problems are and come up with a solution. So one of the things you want to do with regard to your um, uh, picking your avatar is you want to figure out who has the problem that your product solves. Another question he has is who already has spent money on this product? Now you might have a brand new product nobody ever heard of, and that, that's fine. There's some, some benefits to that. But for the uh, most part, the, the products you're coming up with with regard to your, uh, your new business, your entrepreneurial venture, probably some other people you know, have been making and selling this product and, uh, you know, lots of people have been buying it, hopefully have been buying it. So another question is, who's already spent money on this product? If somebody likes uh, orange cars and, you know, you're making orange cars, you probably want to figure out who, who buys orange cars. So another thing is, who's already spent money on this product? If you know that, you go after those people as opposed to going after people who buy all sorts of cars and just hoping sooner or later you're going to reach the person who wants to buy orange cars. And the last point that's mentioned here with regard to things you should ask is you should ask, is there competition already? Do I already have competition out there? I'm new, et cetera, or no, there's, there's competitors out there. And he makes an interesting point here. He said, a lot of people when they start a business want to come up with an idea where there's no competition. I guess there's some cool things about that. And I think in an earlier class we talked about strategies like a blue ocean strategy where you go out someplace where there's nobody else doing this or very few people. There's no competition, so there's no blood in the water, so to speak. It's not a red ocean, it's a blue ocean. Um, but, you know, sometimes having competition is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, a couple things that is good about having competition is it allows you to ask, what are my competitors doing? What are they doing that's working? What are they doing that isn't? What are their successes? What are their failures? 
because if they're doing what you're doing, they're trying to sell or produce or whatever the same product as you, <coughs> you can probably learn a great deal from them. What worked for them? What didn't work for them? And something else about this too, with the, with the fact of these questions and you know having competition already, um, the fact that there's already competition out there, not only tells you about the competitors, but it also should tell you a lot about your targeted customers, your avatar, etc., and this target market. They've been there. They can tell you things about that market, and they can tell you things about this customer that you're going after. That finishes up the second major topic of, I think, five or six that I mentioned here. Let's go to the third major topic here, building your customer avatar, building it. You know, some, some things that you should look at as you're trying to develop this avatar, this perfect customer, this target market that you have, some things that you should look at, and your textbook mentions four, probably more things you want to look at as well, but these four things are pretty good as well. One, you want to uh, do some sort of demographic analysis, demographic analysis, you know, are you targeting you know, older people or younger people, are you tar targeting people with money or not with money and things like that, some sort of demographic analysis. You probably also want to do some sort of psychographic analysis, psychographic. Basically, you want to feel your, your customer's pain. You want to know how they feel, what they like, what they don't like, etc. You want to know your customer's interests and their feelings. That that will help you as you're selling your product. Another thing you might want to do insofar as your analysis is do a behavioral analysis. You know, get an idea of what are the trends and, you know, uh, tendencies of your of your customers. Their behaviors will give you an idea because they might be doing something now, but the trend might be this or that. And you probably want to know what that trend is because you're starting a business, not just for today, but for the future. So maybe if you can have some idea about trends and tendencies, that might help out. And then the last thing mentioned by our author here with regard to building your customer avatar is he says uh, you want to keep in mind now uh, you know, product-related characteristics, product-related characteristics. Basically, how is your product relevant to your customers? And especially, how does your product solve your customers' problems? If you have an idea of how it's relevant to your customers and their problems, this will help you to design your product and come up with different features, etc., with regard to it. So you want to keep in mind your product-related characteristics. Do they fit this target market? Do they fit this avatar that you have? That finishes up the third major point, as I said, about five or five to six of them. Let's go to the fourth major point, and that is learning about your customer. Okay, I have an idea who my, my avatar is going to be, who my target market is going to be. I've got to learn about my customer. One of the things that you tend to find, and it's, it's, it's normal, but it's one of those things that's normal but not necessarily good, and that is oftentimes we guess about and conjecture about uh, you know, our customer. We guess what our customer likes and doesn't like. We guess what our customer will spend and not spend, and where they spend it, and other things like that. We do guesses. Now, sometimes we do it because we are part of the target market. Well, this is what I do, so I'm sure the others do that. But you should keep in mind, you're not your customer. Your customers are probably somewhat different than you. So let's not guess. Let's not conjecture. Let's see if we can find some more basic facts that are more reliable, more credible to help us as we plan our business and what we're going to do. He suggests you do some research, and you can do some research on your target market. You can do it online. You know, you can do it in a lot of other places. Go to the library if anybody ever does that anymore, and I hope that they do. We can do some online. A couple of places you might want to look. Uh, most industry associations have reports and trade publications. They might have white papers and case studies or whatever. And oftentimes those reports and case studies and whatever, they tell you a lot about your, your potential customer. Let's say, for example, I decided to get into the pizza industry. And there's, you know, at least one or maybe a couple of different pizza associations. And they publish things all the time about what customers are buying and not buying and who tried this and who tried that, etc. So that's not necessarily a bad place to go. Let's take a look at what they're saying. Another place you might want to look at is go to blogs and look at magazine articles. You know, you open up, you know, Yahoo and just take a look at some of the articles and I bet you you'll find that there's some articles in there 
that you know talk about your your product, talk about your customers, etc. So go take a look at some of those and do you know dig for some of those. Another place you might want to go to for help, a very good place, is uh, the various government agencies and small business associations that provide usually free advice. You know you you might want to talk to the uh, local chamber of commerce. That that might be the source of help, although. It will definitely try to push you to join them and uh, you know, pay some money on that. But in addition to some government agencies, you might want to take a look at the, uh, the, the U.S. or the Federal Small Business Administration, the SBA. The SBA has a website, sba.gov, uh, and it has a zillion things on it. And there's certainly some things there that might help you. Uh, you might also want to look at an organization called the Small Business Development Center, Small Business Development Center, like anything in government, of course, we, we, we take all those words and we, we try to come up with an acronym for it, an abbreviation, and usually small business development centers are referred to as SBDC, it's plural, SBDCs, small business development centers. You tend to find them uh, usually closely linked to, uh, to colleges and universities, uh, oftentimes off campus, but near campus uh, with regard to it. And they provide uh, all sorts of free information, free guidance for you. Another place to take a look at, and this is, this is actually one of my, my favorite places to take a look at, is you can go to an organization called SCORE, S-C-O-R-E, which stands for another abbreviation, another government abbreviation, Service Corps of Retired Executives, Service Corps of Retired Executives. Basically, if you think about it, you know, a lot of people work their lives, etc. They eventually get up to retirement. Oh, thank God, I'm out of this, etc. And they're, they have a, a ton of knowledge, right, from all their experience. Usually they've been quite successful. Usually they've seen, all, seen everything in the last, uh, well, most of the people retire in 20 or 30 years or whatever. They've usually seen everything. So they know about things. And then they retire, and oftentimes they get bored. So what a lot of them do is they volunteer their time to help small businesses, and they join this thing called SCORE. So let's say, for example, you need some, some assistance uh, with regard to marketing. For all you know, there's a member of SCORE that you can contact that uh, you know, was a vice president of marketing for XYZ or was a head of sales uh, you know, and uh, uh, advertising or whatever for you know, ABC or something like that. They will provide you with free advice and consulting and give you ideas of what to do and how to do it based on their experience. And it's free. Not a bad thing to use. Come to help out. I know also here at Penn State, we have a, another uh, organization that will assist you, and it's called the Launch Box. The Launch Box. And we have uh, launch boxes here at Penn State, and there's a launch box. Of, I think we have something like 20 or so. You know, spread out across the Commonwealth here, usually associated uh, with uh, uh, colleges and universities, usually with uh, some of the Penn State campuses that we have here, and they provide lots of free advice and assistance and things like that. And I, I know the launch box here in our town is called the Happy Valley Launch Box, and I know the people there. They are excellent. They have some great facilities that you can use for free, and they have all sorts of seminars, and they provide advice, etc., and it's all for free really not a bad place to look at. So again, you want to reach out to some of these government agencies and these small business associations. Another place that you can look at for information on your, on your customer, there are statistical and financial databases. I mean, very sophisticated databases. You probably, unless you've done some uh, uh, sophisticated research, uh, business research, you know, maybe in school or whatever, probably never heard of them. Uh, but for example, if you, if you go to Penn State here, you can get access to them uh, online as well as in the library. And I, was, I would advise you to contact the uh, Penn State University e-librarian and, and talk about it, get an idea what these databases are. The amount of information in them is amazing with regard to your, your markets and the information about it. Some, some really good stuff. And again, it's free. A couple of other places to look at. Your textbook says take a look at Google Trends. And there's something called the Consumer Barometer. And uh, just look for, for public data, you know, what, what's going on. Another place to look, another good one that's related to the government again, is the U.S. Census Bureau. U.S. Census Bureau. You think about opening a business in such and such a place, they can provide you with 
how many people live there, how many are single, how many are young, how, many, how much money they're making, all sorts of things like that, that might help with regard to figuring out your target market, where your target market's located. A couple of other places, uh, mentions uh, your, your, your author mentions the Pew Research Center, something called Statistica, Nielsen's My Best Segment. All of those can be quite helpful for you. You might even, you know, of course, you use social media to, to look at. One of the places you might want to look is, is uh, Facebook's Ad Manager. There's some information on markets, etc. in that, Facebook's Ad Manager. And then the last suggestion might actually be the first one, and that is, why don't you go out and survey your customer? Why don't you ask your customers, you know, in person or digitally, emails or whatever, here's a survey, would you mind doing it? You know, there's SurveyMonkey and uh, some other things, uh, I think Field Bloom, etc. Well, survey them. Ask them questions. Now, you know, when you send out these surveys, most people aren't going to respond. But if you get back 20, if you get back 200 or whatever, there's some information you didn't have before. I know in my classes, one of the assignments that I give them, a lab that I give to them, is they have to go out and, uh, with regard to a business they're start, starting, they have to survey their potential customers. And it's amazing to me after they, you know, they read the survey questions, etc., and they give them to the, you know, the people they they're in their target market or whatever. And then we talked about what did you find? It's very infrequent. In fact, I don't think it's ever happened where I've gone around the classroom and at least one team, and usually most teams, haven't found out something they didn't know. Oh, I thought all my customers liked blue, but oh my gosh, no, they like yellow. I thought all my customers liked 10, and no, oh, they, they like 101. So one of the suggestions I have is before you start spending your wheels and spending your time and your money and everything else like that, go out and do a survey. See what people actually like with regard to this product you're coming out. In fact, even ask them if they like that product and how much money would you spend on it and things of that nature. Where do you like to buy it? What size do you like? All those other different things. Do a survey. It can really help you out. That finishes up the fourth major topic in this chapter. Again, that's learning about your customer. It's not a bad idea to learn about your customer. It's a really good idea. Unfortunately, a lot of us prefer instead to just guess, as I said earlier. Not good. Last, uh, the, the fifth major topic I have, which is the last major one, I have a sixth one I'll just talk about a little bit. But the last major uh, uh, topic is segmenting your market. Segmenting. Remember we talked about that earlier. And, and you know, as opposed to going after the, 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 the whole market, what we're going to do is we're going to go after a portion of the market. We call that going after a segment. It's a segmentation strategy. Well, one of the things that the textbook wants you to know is there's another buzzword beside the word segment or segmentation. Sometimes when you do that, and you segment your, the, the market instead of the whole thing, it's a small. Sometimes you go after a really, really small portion of the market. I'm not just going after the, uh, the luxury brand, uh, the luxury market or whatever. I want to go after the luxury, luxury market that uh, wants four-wheel drive vehicles or something. So it's something smaller. It's a, and when you do this, when, when you go to a really, really small segment, there's a buzzword for it. <clears throat> The segment is called a niche, like it. and this strategy, which is a subset of a segmentation strategy, which is also a subset of a, segment, a differentiation strategy, this strategy, this subset, is called a niche strategy. A niche strategy. Now, I want you to think about this. Why would anybody want to go after a really small market? Maybe there's a ton of money in that market. Maybe there's not a whole lot of competition in the market. Maybe you fit that market. You've got some knowledge of something they want, etc. So there are times that a really, really small segment of the market might actually bring you a great deal of success. So you might want to take a look at that. And think about it, too. When you start, maybe as opposed to starting with a full market or segment, maybe you want to go to a small one just to at least start out and see how things work. Because oftentimes the best laid plans of, of, of mice and men and people or whatever Oftentimes, you are not right. I thought this was going to happen. And no, it didn't. Something else happened. So what you want to do here is, um, you know, maybe, maybe start small and then, you know, expand and grow over a period of time as you start to learn things. Now, as you do this, as, as you're looking at your segment and as you're looking at your niche, the author says there, there are at least four questions you want to ask here. And again, I think there's probably far more, but the four questions are good. One, can the segment be clearly identified? Segment or niche. Can, can the segment or niche be clearly identified? 
is it fairly nebulous? Or yes, I, I can find these people. I know exactly who they are and I can get some data on this, etc. That's probably not bad. Another question to ask is, uh, you know, what's the segment's reachable size? How big is the segment? How many people are in it? How much money, etc.? And it's not just total, but it's the ones you can reach. You know, if you've ever watched, uh, you know, Shark Tank uh, on TV, oftentimes one of the things they ask is, what's the size of your market? And usually they're not going after the whole market, so they're not saying, oh, in the United States, you know, almost 300 million or something like that. They're saying, oh, you know, the size of our market is, you know, 45,000 or 150,000 or 1 million or whatever it is. So one of the things that you want to, want to do here is you want, want to see what's the size of this reachable part of the market. And then the last question, the fourth one that the author suggests that you ask, is this segment a good fit for you? Is it a good fit for your business, a good fit for your product? You know, do you have the resources that are necessary? Do you have the skills and ability? Do you have the interest? Are you located well for it, etc.? So you want to ask, does it really fit? You know, sometimes you might find a segment or a niche that, you know, oh, on paper looks really great. But you don't have the knowledge necessary. You don't have the contacts needed. You don't have this resource or that resource. Um, and it's not necessarily a good fit. And, you know, regarding this, one, one fifth question I might ask is, will this market pay a reasonable price, if not a premium price, for what I'm going to do? I mean, why should I spend 24-7, invest a lot of money, a lot of time, take this risk of whatever, if I'm not going to make enough money? I mean, it's, it's one thing to do all this and break even. Oh, thank goodness I broke even. But over the long term, don't you want to make, do more than break even? And is this segment you're going after? Will it and I at least break even and maybe make some bucks? Or will it make this well worthwhile? You might want to even ask that question. That would be my, my fifth question. Well, let's go to the sixth major topic, which is a little, little bit on that iffy side. He calls it, the author calls it, deep dive market segmentation. Deep dive. So you get an idea. We're going to do some, some more research into market segmentation. And he mentions that there are basically two, using broad strokes, types of markets you might want to get into. Let me give the two and then talk a little about each. You might want to get into a business-to-consumer market, business-to-consumer. You're selling something to consumers. Or you might want to get into a business-to-business -business market, B2B as they call it, uh, where you're selling your, your customers or other businesses. And he says if you, if you do this, if, if you... Uh, uh, let, let's start off, if you have a business-to-consumer market, there are various market segmentation methods that you might want to use. And in our textbook that we're currently using, you'll find it on page 93 in figure 11. Page 93, figure 11. These include, you know, some methods you want to do behavioral, demographic, psychographic, geographic, etc., as, you, as you're looking at it. If, on the other hand, you're doing a B2B, a business-to-business -business, uh, market segment, there are various methods that you might want to use here. And in our book, it's on page 97, page 97, figure 13. Figure 13, we want to take a look at that. Things in this include a firmographic analysis. Firmographic, you're looking at size and industry, etc. You're looking also, and here's, here's a, a firmographic, by the way, is a buzzword. Uh, here's another buzzword for you, tiering, T-I-E-R, tiering not tearing with eyes, but tearing. Uh, and what this is, is you're asking yourself, is how valuable is this customer to your business? Not just all the customers, but particular customers. You know, how valuable is this customer to your business? Uh, these customers give me a little, these customers give me some, these, wow, they give me a lot. So you want to kind of tear it. And one of the things that is mentioned here uh, uh, with this, first off, you want to take a look at page 96 in the book at figure 12. Figure 12. But in addition, two other things are mentioned, two other buzzwords are, are mentioned. One is something called the Pareto Principle, the Pareto Principle, which is kind of interesting. I'm not sure if it applies most of the time, but it's going to apply some of the time. And that is the Pareto Principle says that 80% of your revenue, 80% of your revenue is going to come from 20% of your customers. 80% of your revenue is going to come from 20% of your customers. Now, I'm not so sure I agree with 80 and 20 or whatever, but I do agree that whatever business you start, you're probably going to find that some of your customers 
are going to bring you a lot more business than others. You're going to be trying to get all these people, but you know, a couple of them are right. They're going to bring you most of your business or a lot of your business. Um, so that's the Pareto principle. They say 80 and 20, but it might be a little different. But nonetheless, you get you get the idea. And related to this is another buzzword, and that is well. Initially, I'll give it to you as the acronym, all the letters, etc. They're all capitalized. C L V. CLV, and this stands for Customer Lifetime Value. If you have a customer over the lifetime of your business or whatever, what's the value? Oh, the average customer is going to spend, uh, you know, uh, $500 a year. Okay, and I plan to be in business, you know, for 30 years. So what's the value of this customer? 30 times 500 or whatever it might be. So one of the things you might want to try to do is you do some estimates, etc., is you might try to figure out what's the customer lifetime value. The last of the B2B marketing segmentation methods is something called needs-based. Needs-based. What are needs? I'm going to basis in my market segmentation on the needs of my customers. Maybe this group of customers needs a large size, and this one needs a medium size, and this one needs microscopically small or whatever. So I might also segment this based into the needs of my customers. So again, you have to know your customers. You have to know their needs. And doesn't this tie back into one of the key theories or principles that your author's been talking about since the beginning that I've been talking about? When you start a, a business, when you decide I'm going to start selling product X or making product Y or whatever it is, make something, sell something that solves a need where there's a demand out there for your product. And what we're talking about here, this needs-based thing, there's a need. And these are the various needs that customers have. And I, I don't know if I can solve all the needs. Maybe I'll segment my market and just go after the customers who have this need or that need or whatever. Needs-based. So that finishes up uh, Chapter 6. And it gives you some ideas about your market. I cannot, however, stress more, uh, more heavily that this is... This concept of markets and customers is huge because, again, if you don't have any customers or you don't have enough customers or you don't have enough customers spending enough money, if you're in the wrong market, the odds are you're going to fail. Your business is not going to be successful or not nearly as successful as it could have been. And, again, if you're going to be spending 20 hours, you know, 24 hours, seven days a week, and all the stress equity you're going to have, plus the money and other risks that you have, what you want to do is you want to make sure you have plenty of customers, that you're in the right market, and these customers are going to give you enough money to make this venture reasonable, to make this venture attractive for you. So customers and markets are huge. Don't make the assumption you know about them. Study about them. Study about particularly your customers and markets you're getting into. Look at some of this information. Most of it that I just gave to you, those resources are free. Learn about it, because if you learn about it, the odds are you're going to know how to better serve these customers, what their needs are, etc. And if you're able to do that, the odds are that your success is going to come quicker, be bigger, and last longer. With that said and done, I'm going to finish off here with regard to our uh, lecture today on, on Chapter 6. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're enjoying the class. If you have any questions, let me know. And I hope that you have a great rest of the day for it. I'll see you folks later. Bye-bye.